speaker is Peter Bubenik uh, from the University of Florida. Uh, the title of this talk is a joint functors and symmetric neutral categories. Um, um, yeah, for data analysis, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Peter. Great. Yeah, so thank you very much to the organizers for putting together this session and inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I'll be presenting work of uh, one of my PhD students, Alex Elchison. And uh, the, the goal of this, or this project uh, used categories and topology to uh, develop the theory of topological data analysis. Uh, so to start, uh, topological data analysis is a, it's a relatively new subject uh, whose goal is to analyze data with a rich geometric structure. Uh, so we're particularly interested in data where the geometry is both crucial for understanding the data and is sufficiently complicated that kind of standard tools in applied mathematics have a difficult time uh, capturing all of the uh, structure. And one of the main tools in topological data analysis is persistent homology. And I'll explain that to you in, in detail in just a little bit, but first let me give you a, a brief overview of the main idea. Uh, so we start with scientific data, and we encode that as a diagram of spaces. Uh, to that we apply homology with coefficients in a field uh, to get a diagram of vector spaces. And then we extract some invariant uh, of that diagram, and the resulting summary is then kind of fed into subsequent analysis. So uh, I'm going to present maybe the simplest and most common setting for persistent homology. Uh, we start off with a subset of a metric space. So y comma d here is a metric space. And the main example of maybe to keep in mind is that x here is just a finite set of points in Euclidean space. All right. Uh, if we have such data, then we, uh, so we have this discrete data, uh, we turned it into something more topological by fixing a scale parameter r, and then considering the balls of radius r centered at the points in x. And uh, of course, there's a combinatorial version of this, which is given by the nerve of that collection of balls. Uh, this is called the check complex. And uh, here's a picture of what some of these look like for varying scales of R from the points to the plane at the left. Uh, now, it's well known that the combinatorial and topological points of view are compatible. And in, in Euclidean space, there are always going to be homotopy equivalent. Uh, in more general metric spaces, we need uh, to assume that all the non-empty finite intersections are contractible. Now, what's really interesting is not to look at one or some number of values of R, but really to look at all values of this scale parameter. And then as that scale increases, we get inclusions of spaces. And so this gives us a functor from the real numbers to spaces where all the maps are inclusions. So this is sometimes called a filtered space. Uh, taking homology with coefficients in a field, uh, we get a functor uh, from the real numbers to the ve to vector spaces. And that's called a persistence module. So these are the main algebraic objects of study. And uh, the simplest and maybe most important examples of these is something called an interval module. Um, and actually, before I describe that, let me say one thing about persistence modules. Uh, so the category of persistence modules uh, which is the functors from the real numbers into the category of vector spaces is an abelian group. Sorry, an abelian category. And that's just inheriting the structure of, uh, from vector spaces, since vector spaces is an abelian category. Uh, so we can, uh, we have various algebraic constructions which we just get uh, from doing them point wise. So in particular, we can take uh, kernels and co-kernels of morphisms, and uh, we can take direct sums of persistence modules. Uh, in fact, there's a little bit more structure here. Uh, this is a Grotendieck category, uh, and because of that, uh, it satisfies a Krull-Riemann-Schmidt-Azumaya theorem. So if we have decompo 
uh, if we have a decomposition of a persistence module into indecomposable direct summands, then that it will be essentially unique. All right, so it turns out that the kind of indecomposable summands uh, in, in many cases are these interval modules. Uh, so let me describe those to you. So if we fix an interval in the real numbers, uh, there's a corresponding kind of at most one dimensional persistence module, which for each of the points in the interval just has the one dimensional vector space. And for each of the points outside of that interval is equal to zero. And the internal maps of the persistence module uh, within the interval are the identity maps. Uh, so here I've kind of sketched a picture of what this looks like. So if we take the interval J here and we plot the uh, dimension, uh, point-wise dimension of J, then uh, within the interval we have a dimension of one. Outside of that interval we have a dimension of zero. So we see that the support of the interval module J is exactly the interval J. All right, now perhaps the uh, most important structural theorem in persistent homology it, it is the following result of uh, Bill Crawley Bevy, which says that as long as the persistence module is pointwise finite dimensional, then it's isomorphic to a direct sum of interval modules. So this is somehow analogous to the fact that uh, finite dimensional vector spaces can be written uh, at, in terms of a basis. So this is kind of a parametrized basis that's compatible. Uh, so because of this, uh, every persistence module, uh, at least assuming that it's pointwise finite dimensional, which we will do, uh, can be completely described up to isomorphism by a collection of intervals. So this collection of intervals has a, a special name. It's called the barcode of the persistence module. And uh, at the bottom left here, we see a, a figure describing what uh, these look like. Uh, so it's just a, a collection of intervals. Uh, for convenience, they've been stacked one on top of each other. The order kind of in the, in the y-axis has no meaning. Uh, and once we have kind of too many intervals to fit on the screen, a more convenient representation is called the persistence diagram, which just plots the endpoints uh, of each of the intervals. So this is what one of the persistence diagrams looks like on the right. Now, uh, once we start doing this, uh, we're maybe at initial, initially we're just pleased at having this beautiful visualization of our data. Uh, but then, of course, we don't just have kind of one experiment on which we are computing these, but scientists have many experiments. And we produce kind of an, a persistence diagram for each repetition. Uh, so one of the first things that we want to do is to define a distance between these persistence diagrams. So, I mean, the main point here is to quantify data. Uh, so we certainly want to attach numbers uh, between kind of repetitions of observations. All right, so very early on in the subject, uh, people came up with a, a one parameter family of distances uh, called the Wasserstein distance. So these are closely related to the uh, distances of the same name uh, applied to probability measures and used in optimal transportation theory. And on the left here, we have kind of two persistence diagrams drawn on top of each other, one with uh, blue circles and the other one with orange disks. And uh, to get a distance between them, we want to think of kind of deforming one of the persistence diagrams into the other by moving points. And uh, there, there's kind of a stumbling block to this because the number of points might be different. Uh, and then we need to remember that each of these points represents an interval. And uh, we can also kind of make an interval go away by shrinking it down uh, to its midpoint. Uh, so on top of the plane, that corresponds to moving 
a point to the closest point on the diagonal. Uh, so with this kind of little extra technical thing, technical tool, uh, we just uh, look at kind of the infimum of all deformations from one uh, persistence diagram into the other. And each of those gives us uh, a bijection uh, between the points. And then we just measure how far each of the points is moved using our favorite distance in the plane. Uh, and that list of numbers, uh, we turn into one number by taking the p-norm. Okay, so this number, uh, oops. Um, so we have uh, the p-norm of this list of number here. So p is between one and infinity. So we have a one parameter family of p Wasserstein distances. Uh, there's one little technical condition that these satisfies that will show up later on, uh, which is they are p sub additive. So what does that mean? So we can take, uh, if we have the four persistence diagrams, we can take uh, disjoint unions of them. And then uh, it turns out that the P Wasserstein distance satisfies this inequality here. So we, if we do them kind of first in pairs, that gives us two distances. And then we take the P norm of that, we get this inequality. All right. So all of that is kind of classical within the subject of topological data analysis. And uh, our project was to give this a categorical footing. Uh, so to start with, uh, we want to interpret persistence diagrams, not just kind of combinatorially, but a little more algebraically. And we think of them as being formal sums in this upper half plane. So, uh, so I've introduced this notation here, which is just all of the ordered pairs x, y, where x is less than y. So we have a set, and a persistence diagram is a formal sum in this set. Uh, so we can think of all persistence diagrams as being contained in the free commutative monoid on this, upper, on this half plane. Now, one of the other crucial pieces of information that we have here that we don't include include immediately in that uh, discussion is that it's a metric space. Uh, so I'm going to get to that in just a second. But, but first, let me observe that there's another important ingredient, which is the diagonal kind of has a special role. Uh, so in fact, it's better to encode the, think of this uh, free commutative monoid actually as a quotient monoid. So it's isomorphic to the quotient of the free commutative monoid on the closed half plane modulo the free commutative monoid on the diagonal. Okay, so let me kind of uh, call this the free commutative monoid on this pair uh, of sets. And in fact, that pair of sets uh, has a metric structure. It's a metric pair. So let me uh, define the category of metric pairs. So these have objects uh, that look like this. So A here is just a subset of the metric space X. And then the morphisms are given by uh, one Lipschitz maps, which are, are maps that are kind of non-expansive. Uh, so within the category of metric pairs, there's a kind of useful subcategory, which is of pointed metric spaces, uh, where the, the subset is a point. And uh, we will make use of that. All right. So, uh, uh, so that is the background. And not, now it's time for some category theory. So uh, the category of pointed metric spaces, it turns out has a family of symmetric monoidal products. Uh, so for each pair of pointed metric spaces, uh, we take the product of the underlying sets, and now we're going to define a metric on it using a uh, number p. Uh, so the metric between a pair of metric spaces, uh, well, we could take the distance between the x-coordinates, and we can take the distance between the y-coordinates. So that gives us two numbers, and then there's kind of a 
one primary fam family of uh, ways to turn that into a single number, which is just to take the p-norm. So each of these metrics gives us a different symmetric monoidal product. And uh, for each of these, we have uh, a, category, a symmetric monoidal category. And for these symmetric monoidal categories, uh, we can consider the category of commutative monoids internal to that symmetric monoidal category. Uh, so that is what we have here. So let me repeat, these are commutative monoids internal to the symmetric monoidal category of pointed metric spaces with, with this uh, particular uh, metric here. Now, uh, that category has a forgetful functor to metric pairs. And it turns out it has a left adjoint. So this was our main result. And what we were very excited about, that this left adjoint, this universal construction, uh, gives us exactly the construction that is used in topological data analysis. So if we start with this metric pair uh, of this half plane, uh, and apply this universal construction, uh, then we get exactly uh, persistence diagrams together with the P. Wasserstein distance. Um, so let me say kind of two additional things here. Uh, one of which is that this category, which I gave in kind of a, an abstract way, has a bit of a, a more a concrete description. Uh, so this, this category of commutative monoids internal to pointed metric spaces, it has objects given by P sub additive uh, commutative metric monoids. And uh, the morphisms are given by one Lipschitz metric, sorry, one Lipschitz monoid homomorphisms. All right, so just kind of from, from obvious things from functoriality, uh, we get that the P Wasserstein distance is the universal, meaning the largest P sub additive metric for persistence diagrams. All right, so this is kind of a, a nice thing in topological data analysis. Uh, but I think what's even nicer is that this approach, this kind of categorical approach to uh, building larger structures from simpler things can be extended. Uh, and so in more recent work, we've shown that given any metric pair, uh, there's canonical isometric embeddings into uh, increasingly larger structures. So each of these is given by, by a left adjoint, similar to the one that I gave before. So the first one is, is the one that we've already seen. Uh, so here we have free commutative monoids. Uh, so these are persistence diagrams. And uh, note here, I've, I've restricted to P equals one. It turns out to go any further in this ladder, for P bigger than one, uh, everything is trivial. Things kind of collapse. So P equals one is the only one that, that works. Uh, so uh, going further, we look at free abelian groups on a pair of metric spaces. So these are not just formal sums, but formal signed sums. And these are, do arise in certain constructions in topological data analysis. And we've started calling these virtual persistence diagrams. And now we can keep going. So we, we can do free uh, vector spaces, so free real vector spaces. And the... Uh, one Wasserstein distance actually gives us a norm here. Uh, uh, and we 
can take the completion of that to get a free Bonnock space. All right. And now things get really interesting because now we've embedded our persistence diagrams into a setting uh, where we can do probability theory. So uh, this opens up uh, certain tools and statistics to us and it is kind of a, a nice setting. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, and uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for the great talk. Um, are there any questions or comments? Uh, well, if not, let's uh, thank Peter again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a seven minute uh, break until uh, the next talk. <laughs>